of the Danske Cannabis Behandlere, uh, Verbundet mot Roskift, and the World Federation on, uh, Against Drugs. I would like to warmly welcome you to the Nordic Summit on Cannabis and express my gratitude for your um, attendance and of course to all our speakers who for being here with us today and tomorrow and after un some uncertain times um, we are happy that we are finally able to be together and welcome you in person and uh, also I would like to give a warm welcome again to all our online participants and um, give an extra warm welcome to them. Um, the hybrid format of the summit uh, will allow us to connect globally and exchange knowledge and research on the effect of cannabis and provided by our speakers and by each other. Um, inspire each other, thrive together to push against the legalization of cannabis. Overall, um, cannabis continues to be a theme uh, in the public debate um, and not only becomes favorable among public, but also politicians suggest um, changing policies. Yet from adverse health effects to implications on youth need to be reflected upon and taking into account before policies can even enter the discussion or even enter the debate of change. Therefore, the Nordic Summit on Cannabis arrives not one moment too early. Um, we desperately need to inform uh, the public to the treatment of the treatment community and politicians. The Nordic countries are seemingly taking visible or invisible, the, the nonetheless rhetorical steps towards the legalization of cannabis. Before decisions for change can be made, the possible implications need to be understood. Therefore, the delivery of evidence-based um, information is param of paramount importance. If we, uh, therefore the yeah, if we as a society and global community hope to guide all parties towards less harm from this substance through misinformed guidelines. Therefore, we would like to give you the wide guide. Um, the booklet consists of research, reflections, and recommendations from our speakers. These strong and evidence-based guidelines provided by our speakers can be used in your work um, and help advocating among politicians in the discussion of globalization, uh, of legalization. Sorry. We have added the wide guide to the USB sticks, um, which are in your goodie bag, and which is placed on your seats. For those attending online, we will be sending you an email with the white guide and also put it in a chat during the day. The white guide is also available um, to order as a printed version to be handed out later on. We will send the white guide to your address for 150 uh, kronos SE key, which includes the transportation cost all around the world. Please send an email to us, info at wfad.se to order it or if you would like to have more information on it as well. So the Nordic Summit is divided into two overarching topics. Today we will focus on the long-term effects and impairments caused by cannabis. Um, after each presentation, we will have room for discussion, so the room for questions to our speakers. We strongly encourage you to ask questions to our speakers. And for those who are here in person with us, you can raise your hand and we will pass a microphone on to you. And for those who attend virtually, um, you can ask the questions through Zoom in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. And we will present your questions to our speakers. And to get to know each other for our online participants, we encourage you to contact and write down your name and your organization in the chat box and contact other attendees throughout the event. In the breaks, we will try to have breakout rooms ready for everyone, uh, which you can uh, go to and talk to your fellow, fellow online attendees virtually. We will provide you with more details when the break arrives. Without further ado, I would hear hereby officially like to welcome open the summit. I have one small remark regarding the program in the printed booklet here you have received. Um, the time for the presentation of Thijs uh, Bendixson is 40. Instead of 10.30, his presentation will start at 10.45 um, after the coffee break and will last till 10 past 10, 11. The program has been adjusted for those online. Um, before giving the word to our speakers um, who will present their research, my colleagues and I will provide a short overview of the current debates on legalization 
in the three Nordic countries. So well, the, the theme of today. And first up is the situation in Denmark. Um, here, this one will be presented by my colleague Christopher Smith, and he is the founder of the Danske Cannab Network Cannabis Therapist and the author of Teens Using Cannabis, a guide for concerning parents and the most important book you have ever read about cannabis. Working as a clinician and have educated more than 500 therapists, it's my pleasure to give you the floor. So, good to see you all. Um, all right, so uh, my job is to say uh, something about the situation in Denmark. So, here it goes. Uh, I can't really say Denmark without saying Pusher Street and Christiania. A worldwide known phenomenon where you seemingly can buy cannabis right off the streets, in the middle of the capital. Seemingly because this national tourist attraction lets visitors to believe that cannabis can be bought legally in Denmark. This place and the easily accessible cannabis have been the center of legalization debate in Denmark. But more importantly, the problem when it comes to communicate the harmful effects to the youth. The logic seems to be that cannabis can't be harmful uh, when it's sold off the street and in a place that historically has been associated with peace and love. Understanding cannabis through that lens might explain the fact that 95% of the youth uh, under 18 new in treatment indicates that cannabis is their main substance and thereby reason for seeking treatment. This easy access point for the youth to try out cannabis has grown to be the epic center of illegal cannabis activity with following shooting and killings. Currently, recreational cannabis use and possession are not legally regulated. Also, the production, import, export, buying and selling cannabis are illegal in Denmark. However, the debate of legalization has been strongly apparent in media and politics over the years. The public, media, and politics seem to be increasingly leaning to the legalization of recreational cannabis. In January 2018, five of the nine national parliamentary parties showed their support for the state-controlled legalisa legalization scheme. And during that time, the majority within the Danish parliament opposed legalization and decriminalization. However, several cities have been openly in favor of the legalization of recreational cannabis. For example, the city of Copenhagen sent in several proposals. These proposals have been rejected until now, even though recreational legalization has not gained the needed political support yet. The parliament voted for a four year trial on medical cannabis in December 2017. The trial did face a position from the Danish doctors due to the lack of beneficial medical evidence. However, the Patients Association and the cannabis industry wish for a trial to become permanent or extended after the official end date, December 2021. So with Copenhagen continue, uh, continuing pushing for legalization, the current variability of medical cannabis and the positive media outlet the discussion and lobbying is still very much alive. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. And my other fellow colleague, uh, Krut Reynos, um, from Forbundet Modros Gift, will present you with the current situation on Norway. Uh, Knut Reynos is an educated ma magister of sociology of the, at the University of Oslo. Over the course of his, his career, he has been the head of the section at the National Directorate for Prevention of Alcohol and Drug Problems. The head 
of drug and alcohol of the uh, and alcohol section at the Department of Primary Healthcare and Social Affairs at the Municipality of Oslo, followed by being a special advisor at the Drug and Alcohol Addiction Service at the Municipality of Oslo. And then he became the special advisor at the Department uh, for the Treatment of Drug and Alcohol Problems at the University of Oslo, uh, Oslo University Hospital, excuse me. Currently, he is the head of the board of the League Against Intoxicants. Um, he has also been the founder of the periodical Modruskiv Against Intoxicants uh, for some years. Besides this, Knut has been the author of various articles and publications in Norwegian and English. Knut, the floor is yours. The sound man, he, he uh, assured that I should do nothing. <laughs> okay, but uh, the audience, oh, oh, <laughs> here we come. Uh, I would like to thank for the opportunity to participate in this uh, Nordic Summit on Cannabis, which will hopefully, hopefully have ripple effects both in the Nordic countries and perhaps in the rest of the world. And uh, congratul congratulations to uh, World Federation Against Drugs, which have been the initiators. There has been a drug liberal development in Norway for some years. While uh, politicians in the 1980s competed for as strict a criminal law as possible in the years that followed, an increasingly liberal case law was followed when it came to sentencing for drug offenses. As so today, no one is in prison for only use and possession of drugs for their own use. In 2002, a criminal law commission proposed to legalize all drug use. It was then voted down. But the ideas have to this day been promoted by increasingly lead loader groups. The user organizations have been an important driving force in the work to bring about a sentiment in political circles towards decriminalization of drugs. The legalization mindset was uh, re revived by the legalization of marijuana in some states in the US and Canada. Norway has been ruled by a conservative governing coalition for the past eight years. In 2017, Minister of Health Bent Høie from the Conservative Party proclaimed that he had changed his mind and now advocated a decriminalization of use and possession of illegal drugs for personal use. In 2018, the government set up a committee which was to, quote, prepare for the implementation of the government's drug reform, 
were the responsibility for society's response to the use and possession of illegal drugs, drugs for own use is transferred from the justice sector to the health service, unquote. Heye agreed with a majority in the Storting, the, the Norwegian parliament, that even if a position and use of drugs should still be prohibited, their reactions to drug offenses should be transferred from the justice sector to the health service. The Drug Reform Committee was given the following mandate, and I, I quote, purpose, the government wants to change the authorities' reactions to people who are taken for use and possession of drugs from punishment to help, treatment and follow-up. The government will implement a drug reform to ensure a better offer for drug addicts, where the responsibility for society's response to the use and possession of illegal drugs for personal use is transferred from the justice sector to the health service." Unquote. The purpose uh, formulation shows that it was first and foremost the heavily drug addicts who were thought of, and perhaps not to the same extent the vast majority of young exp experimental users and recreational users. Just before Christmas 2019, the committee presented a proposal to decriminalize such offenses, which means making them unpunishable. After much discussion, the government presented a proposal in accordance with this. A table was also presented uh, here of how much drug of various kinds of one could carry before it was punishable. For example, heroin, two grams. Cocaine, two grams. Amphetamine, two grams. MDMA, 0 0.5 grams. And cannabis, 10 grams. A minority in the committee, just one person, who represented the police, presented a separate proposal in which he disagreed with a general decriminalization but agreed that heavy drug users should not be punished for use and possession for their own use. In the wake of the Drug Reform Committee's recommendation, and even more so after the government presented its proposal in line with the majority of the Drug Reform Committee, there has been an intense debate in Norway. My presentation here is only a bleak reflection of the engagement on both sides. Most major newspapers and media have been in favor of decriminalization. The user organizations have been unanimously in favor, while the opposing forces have had less leeway. A collection of prevention organizations created a parental appeal against drugs on Facebook, and this received some support. Critical consultation statements came from bodies such as the Norwegian Medical Association, the Center of Drug and Addiction Research, the National Institute of Public Health, and from the police, while several hospitals and professionals uh, also supported the proposal. Sorry, sorry about that. The governing parties, the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party and the Christian Party voted for this proposition, pr proposition in the Storting in, on the uh, 3rd June this year, together with two left-wing parties and the Green Party, while a majority consisting of the Labour Party, the Centre Party and the Progress Party which is a, a, a right-wing party, um, uh, they voted against. A narrow majority, therefore, voted down the proposal. 
Most decisive for this result was that the Labour Party's uh, national meeting in April this year decided to oppose the proposal with approximately two-thirds majority. In return, they wanted to decriminalize, de decriminalize possession and use for heavy drug users, but uh, opposed the general decriminalization for all. In the starting on 13, 30, no, on 3rd June, there was a clear majority against general decriminalization of drugs. The Labour Party and the Centre Party wanted decriminalization for the most heavily de dependent, but this was questionable law and was not adop adopted either. What uh, was decided was four short decisions, and I, maybe I, I should quote. That's, this is in uh, a solemn language. Quote, the Storting asks the government to ensure that the police do not prosecute violators of Section 24 on, of the Medicinal Products Acts, where the violator provides assistance or calls emergency services in emergency situations, or where such a viola violation is discovered when the violator reports other criminal offences. Uh, unquote. And uh, comment to that, um, the intention is that those who contact the health service by, for example, an overdose or an accident should not be prosecuted, even if they are obviously intoxicated or possess minor amounts of drugs. Therefore, this provision has already been called the Good Samaritan Law. And resolu resolution 1116, quote, the Storting asks the government to ensure that information in the reaction register about persons who have been subjected to criminal reactions for the use and possession of drugs for their own use is blocked after three years. Blocking proposes, uh, presupposes that no more criminal offence have been registered in the relevant period." Unquote. And a comment to that. One-time disclosure of possession and use of drugs will be deleted from the record after three years unless new criminal offences are discovered in the meantime. Uh, there are uh, two more resolu resolutions, but I'll uh, skip that. On the 13th of September this year, there was a parliamentary election in Norway. Drug policy has not been an important element in the election campaign or in the election debate. Other topics like uh, climate policy and whether Norway should cut out or reduce its oil and gas production came in the forefront. But now there will be a change of government. The parties that opposed general decriminalization gained a fairly large ma majority. But as we speak, one of the three parties that are now exploring the possibilities to end the government, the Socialist Left Party, is in favor of criminal decriminalization. The other two are the Labour Party and the Centre Party, uh, who are against. The drug reform will prob probably not be solved in the government declaration, but go on to a new government proposal in a foreseeable future with the main emphasis on treatment and prevention. But the decriminalization people are still working for their goals and the debate will probably go on for another couple of years. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Knut, for your reflections on Norway. Very interesting and very good. Sorry, that's my phone. No, that's my phone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's my phone. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, yeah, it's good to see. I mean, it's interesting developments happening right now. Like it's still going towards, but yet it's also good to hear that there's still some room and time for coming up discussions and that not everyone is in favor yet. And hopefully soon we'll be able to give more of these research that we will present today to the politicians. <laughs> Thank you.
So it's a different person on the PowerPoint slide, yet I will present uh, on her behalf um, on the Swedish situation. Um, my colleague, Sara Heine, she has been uh, reflecting on the Swedish situation quite a lot. She unfortunately couldn't be here today, and therefore I will take her part. Um, Sara Heine is responsible for the communications at uh, Narcotica Politisk Center in Stockholm, and from 2012 till 2018, she has been a deputy secretary of the IOGT NTO uh, at the International Department. Um, so the Swedish situation um, is, well, there is also a fairly intense debate um, on the current Swedish drug policy and how it can be devel developed in the future. And today I'll present you a brief summary um, of where the debate is and why. Today, all non-medical use of uh, drugs is criminalized in Sweden and the criminalization of drugs was introduced in 1988. And there was a sharpening of penalties in 1993. Uh, here, imprisonment of a maximum of six months was introduced on the penalty scale. Um, in practice, however, imprisonment uh, is not imposed for minor drug offenses. But the fact that prison is included in the range of punishments uh, makes it possible for the policy uh, police to carry out a body search or, and ask for ure urine and blood test. So when they started measuring drug use in Sweden 50 years ago, uh, the consumption was on a much higher level than it is today. It declined sharply during the 1980s and the early 90s, and began to increase again from the mid 90s. Over the past 20 years, the consumption has continued to increase somewhat, but Sweden still has, in comparison with other countries in Europe, a low drug consumption. In total, 3 to 4 percent of the total population has used cannabis in the past year, and if including all kinds of drugs, the number is around 9 percent. The consumption and attitude um, towards drugs are monitored annually by CN, which stands for the Central Verbundenheit for Alcohol or Narcotica Plissning. Sorry for my pronunciation. <laughs> they conduct their survey, Skoleleves um, Vanor, among students uh, in secondary school in year nine, which is around 15 years old, and in high school year two, which is 17 years old. The latest survey shows that 9% of the boys and 6% of the girls in grade 9 have ever have tried drugs. In high school year 2, um, the numbers are approximately the double. The level of consumption among young people have been relatively stable in the recent years, but the frequency of use has increased somewhat among young people who had already used drugs. But while the consumption is relatively low, Sweden has a high rate of drug-related deaths. However, it is important to remember that both researchers at, and the U European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction emphasize the difficulty of making comparisons between countries in terms of mortality. Um, as the methods of classifying deaths differ between the countries, which affects the figures reported. Regardless, Sweden has a high mortality rate. And even though it has started to decrease from 2015, here arrests because of arrests by the police and judgment of the Supreme Court uh, concerning the sale of fentanyl have contributed to a reduction in the number of deaths. The number of deaths um, the, the reduction has only occurred among men. Um, among women, actually, the numbers of drug-related deaths has instead increased slightly. The level of drug-related deaths and the comparison with other European countries has led to a de debate about Swedish drug policy. And in this debate, the policy is presented as failed and outdated. However, no definition nor reflection is made on what is the Swedish drug policy and what it actually includes. What part of it is outdated and what part of it is unsuccessful. The debate has become quite narrow uh, with the argument that the current policy does not work. The mortality is high, the policy must be reformed, and the only situation, solution is decriminalization or legalization even. The focus of the debate uh, on mortality and the need to provide support and the benefits of uh, and 
support and treatment for those with addiction and a lesser focus on prevention, early intervention and the benefits of maintaining a low um, level of consumption. The negative consequences that drug use can bring, in addition to addiction and mortality, are seldom a part of the debate. And some debaters are beginning to distinguish between the so-called rec recreational use, which they find unproblematic, and addiction. The Swedish debate is also colored by the ongoing debate in Norway, Finland, and other European countries. The legalization of cannabis in Canada and some US states in the United States are also being raised as arguments as of de for decolonization and or legalization. Although the actual lessons learned from the development in the United States and in Canada are not reflected in the debate. The debate on mortality has put pressure on the Swedish government, which in the past two years has introduced legislative changes linked to drug tra trafficking and decided to appoint a government inquiry of the current Swedish drug policy. However, they have been clear that they do not wish to include decriminalization as part of inquiry. A decision that has been criticized from both researchers, the public health agency, and the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions. This criticism uh, also has also been picked up by other debaters as arguments for decriminalization or legalization of cannabis. And even though the question, the reason for these actors to raise the question of decriminalization uh, differs. The arguments used are often the same. For many of them, it's about reducing drug-related deaths. For others, there are ideological or other motives behind it. Recently, the question of legalizing cannabis has been raised by a small number of debaters, lead writers, and political and youth associations. The main arguments have been personal freedom and the wish to punish people with addiction. Another reason why legalization is beginning to be discussed is the increased problem with gang violence and shootings. The argument is that legalization would remove the basis for criminal gangs, for example, the illegal drug dealing. If that argument is to be consistent, it would result in a legalization of not only cannabis, but of all drugs. However, neither research nor data from Canada or the United States that have legalized show any decline of gang violence as an effect of legalization. The main argument for decriminalization is the assumption that people do not dare to seek treatment due to the fear of being punished. It is then seen as an important explanation for the high number of de drug-related deaths. However, a comparison between countries in Europe where ha some have decriminalized and others that have not um, does not show any clear connection between the legalization and mortality uh, in drugs. In Sweden, the number of people seeking support care and treatment usually is usually increasing and the vast majority of those who die due to drugs are already known to the health service. It, this indicates the need of a better organized support and treatment rather than decriminalization to be able to reduce the number of drug-related deaths. The Narcot Narcotica Politics Center sees the importance of maintaining the current criminalization based on the risk that a decriminalization could increase consumption, accelerate a shift in norms and attitudes towards drugs and reduce the tools for the police. Social care and other access actors to work with early intervention. In their contacts with social care, coordinators on a local and regional level, the police and people that with their own experience of addiction there are many examples where the police abilities to intervene has been a contributing or a direct legacy, decisive factor for people to stop using drugs. But while criminalization seems to have a damping, dampening effect on consumption and provides an opportunity for early intervention, it also has its challenges. We thus do not see the need for an inquiry of decriminalization, but rather an evolution evaluation of the positive and negative effects of criminalization and the need to propose measures that can reduce the latter. We
can both maintain the current criminalization and at the same time work for a better care and treatment system. Here are two examples that Sara has given of measures that they think could contribute. The first one is the introduction of a good cemeterian law in case of an overdose, meaning that such a law already exists in Canada, among other places, and that it means that no one should hesitate to call 112 or any other emergency number to save lives in fear of getting punished. The second proposal is the review on society's reaction to minor drug offenses. The current penalty with, um, with associated fines can contribute to people refraining from using drugs. But it's not certain that these fines are always the answer. For those who have an addiction, treatment can be a better solution. And for those who are minors, other kinds of support and measures can give better results. Finally, when talking to people working with drug-related issues on a local or regional level, they do not call for decriminalization or legalization. Instead, they see all the gaps in the system for early intervention, comorbidity, and in current organization of care and treatment, but also the possible resu results when the gaps are actually being sealed. Measures which can contribute to humane and restrictive drug policy.